my name's Kurt Thorne. I'm the director of the Nikon Imaging Center at UCSF, which we'll be seeing later in this film. And today I'm going to talk to you about optical sectioning and confocal microscopy. And these are a family of techniques that allow you to produce three-dimensional images of biological samples using microscopy, such as this uh, pretty image you're seeing in the background here, which is a piece of mouse brain. So the general goal of this set of techniques is to produce three-dimensional images of biological samples. And here's a particularly striking example. This is a, an embryonic mouse lung. Um, it's the whole mouse lung, and it's been fixed and stained. And what we've done here is to take a series of images that record the entire three-dimensional structure of it so that we can generate a movie like this where we're showing the, the 3D volume of it, and we can rotate it around in a computer and see it from different angles. So I want to talk today is, is about the techniques that make this possible. And one particularly important aspect of this is that conventional microscopy, so-called wide-field microscopy or wide-field epifluorescence microscopy that you may have heard about, produces very nice images, but it produces images that have both in-focus and out-of-focus light. And so if you look at this image here, you can see that there's stuff that's clear and, and sharp and in-focus in it, but then there's a lot of blur that shows up on top of those regions, which is produced by parts of the sample that are not in focus at, um, while it's being imaged. And one way to get around that is so-called confocal microscopy, which I'll be explaining in detail. And here's a confocal image of that same specimen, and you can see that the out-of-focus parts are now gone, and we only see the nice, clear, in-focus, crisp detail of the sample. So how does this work? So there, there's two pieces to this. One is the optical sectioning part, and the second is the confocal. And first, I'm going to tell you about the optical sectioning. And the idea is here that if we have a microscope like this confocal that can take those in-focus images, what we can do is to take a slice through a sample. So here's our sample, and then up here is the resulting image taken at this slice through it. And now if we step that sample with respect to the microscope, so we move the sample down here, now we take a slice through along here, and we get this image through that piece of that cube. And then we can repeat this process over and over again, take a slice out of the top of it here, and we do this many times, and we get a stack of images that record the focal planes from the top to the bottom of this, this cube here. And now we, what we can do is load those into a computer and generate a three-dimensional reconstruction. So recalculate in the computer what this object would look like from different angles. And so by doing that, we go back and, and can produce an image of the original cube. <clears throat> so here's an example of this on a real biological specimen. This is um, the nematode worm C. elegans. It's been using GFP and DS-RED, which Nico has talked about in his lecture. Um, we, it's been labeled with two, two different neurons have been labeled with GFP and, and DS-RED fluorescent proteins. And so if we look at these slices going through it, um, you can see the individual neurons here, and you can see the paths of the neurons um, that make these lines through the sample. And that was 85 Z slices, and now what we've done is to load those into the computer and then generate views of that sample from all different angles. And now here is showing that three-dimensional rotation, and so you can see now the architecture of these two neurons in the head of this, this worm. Um, So that's the idea behind optical sectioning, which is to take these, these slices at different focal planes and then stack them up and recalculate the three-dimensional structure of the object. Um, and now I want to tell you how we actually get those in-focus images and how we get rid of the out-of-focus light. And this is the confocal microscopy idea. So here's a, a sort of a schematic of a simple microscope where we're imaging a single point in our sample. The sample is this little blue ball down here. We've got this blue excitation light coming in. It's focused to a point in the sample through the objective lens here. And that excites fluorescence inside that sample. The fluorescence light is re-emitted from the sample, goes through the objective, comes up through a tube lens here, and is focused onto this camera up top. Um, that's how you produce an image in a conventional microscope. The problem is, oh yeah, so we've got light coming from this little green ball at focus here. The problem is now we've got also regions elsewhere along this cone being excited. And you can see, for instance, there's this you know, light green ball up at the top of the sample here. 
which is also emitting light, and that light doesn't come to a focal point on the camera, it instead comes to a focus somewhere above the camera, and that gives rise to this blurry, out-of-focus light where the camera actually is. And so this is the, the fundamental problem here with doing conventional fluorescence microscopy on thick specimens, which is that you get light emitted from all focal planes in the sample, but only one of those comes to a focus. The others are not in focus and are all just blurry. And so that produces a lot of haze in your image that prevents you from getting a nice, crisp, clear image of it. So it turns out there's a very simple trick to get around this, which is basically to put a pinhole in the, in the microscope here. So again, we've got our single point being illuminated. It excites fluorescence from the focus. And now what we've done is to put this pinhole in the sample here. And that pinhole will pass the light that comes from that focal point, but it will not pass light that comes from other focal points in the sample. So again, for our, our light coming from the top of the sample, you can see this light isn't focused at the pinhole, and so it hits the sides of the pinhole and is blocked and doesn't make it to our, our detector up here. And this is the idea of confocal microscopy. It's called confocal because the pinhole here is in the same focal plane as the sample, so it's confocal with the sample. So you may notice that there's a, a problem with this, which is that only lets you image a single spot in your sample at once. And this is potentially a huge drawback to confocal microscopy. And so the, the trick to get around it is to do raster scanning, where you image, instead of taking a picture of the whole sample at once, you, take a, you image each spot in the sample at a time and measure how bright that one spot is, move over a little bit, measure the next spot, and move over, and so on and so forth until you've imaged the whole sample. So if our sample's the smiley face here, the idea is we're going to put this grid over it of all the spots we're going to record, and then we're just going to march over that sample spot by spot, recording the intensities, and then in a computer, add up the intensities for each spot to reconstruct the image here. So we're not taking an, an image of the whole sample at once. Instead, we're taking it spot by spot and just saying how bright each of those spots is and then building up those image from all those individual spots. <clears throat> to do this, of course, we need a laser or we need a, an illumination system that allows us to focus the light to a nice tight spot on the sample. Um, and while you can do this with conventional lamp sources, they're not very bright and they're hard to focus. So it turns out that lasers are what has made confocal microscopy really possible, is that you can take a laser, it's a very collimated, it's high power, and it can be focused to this nice tight spot in your sample, so you're only illuminating that one spot at a time. And you can reject light that comes from anywhere that's not in that spot. So lasers are what have really made confocal microscopy take off in the last 30 years or so. Um, of course, we need a way to scan the sample. We want to record the intensities from these different points in the sample. And to do that, we need to move the spot across the sample. And that's done by changing the angle at which light enters our objective here. So again, here's our objective. We've got light coming in right now straight down. And so it's focused exactly on the center of the objective. But if we change the angle of that illumination, so now we're coming in from the side here, we've now shifted the, the focus spot of that light off to the side a little bit. If we come in from the other side, at a, the other um, angle, now we're focused to the other side of the sample. So that's how you can illuminate different spots in the sample is just by changing the angle at which the light comes into the objective. Of course, now in our, the diagram I showed you before, the pinhole was fixed. And so this light coming from the side of the sample over here wouldn't make it through the pinhole. So we need to have some way of, of getting the light so that no matter where the light comes from in the sample, it goes back through that same pinhole so that we can throw away the out of focus light. And it turns out there's a very simple trick to do that which is basically to use the same mirrors that we're going to use to move the light around um, to scan different spots on the sample and to bring the emission light that comes back from the sample off those same set of mirrors so that it undoes whatever scanning angle we put on it in the first place. So the idea here is this is a simplified schematic of an actual confocal is you've got a dichroic mirror here You'll have heard of, these are discussed in, in Nico's talk on fluorescence. Um, and this mirror is set up so that it'll reflect the laser beam, but transmit the emission light from the sample. So our excitation light from the laser is in blue, the emitted light is in green. So our, our light comes in off this dichroic, 
scanned off these mirrors, and so those mirrors there are, are steered around to change the angle at which the laser light hits the sample, and so change the position in the sample we're imaging. Um, so the light comes down off those mirrors, scanned to different spots on the sample. Our emitted light in green comes back off, goes off those same mirrors, which are at the same angle, so they'll exactly undo the scanning that they put on in the first place. So now the light, regardless of where it came from in the sample, comes back along the same path through that dichroic and through the pinhole here, which now doesn't have to move because the same mirrors that have scanned the laser light across the sample have unscanned it coming back. And then again, we've got our detector here, which allows us to record the intensity of the light that came from that spot in the sample. So this is the basic idea behind how a confocal microscope works. <clears throat> I haven't yet said anything about the detector, um, and I don't have a lot to say about them, except that because we're scanning spot by spot on the sample, you need to A, have a detector that's sensitive to the light that comes from that spot. It doesn't need to be a camera, it just needs to measure the intensity at that one point in time. And it needs to be very fast, because if we want to scan, say, you know, a one megapixel image, a thousand by a thousand, we only have a few microseconds to spend at each point if we want this to take you know, a reasonable amount of time of a few seconds to acquire that whole image. And so if photomultiplier tubes are an old technology that are ideally suited for this kind of application. And what they are basically is a vacuum tube. They've got a window on them here. So your light comes in through this window and it hits what's called a photocathode, which is a material that generates electrons when light strikes it. And those electrons come out and then there's a series of um, focusing dynodes, these are just pieces of metal with high voltage across them that attract the electrons, and then when those electrons strike them, kick out additional electrons so you get amplification. And you have maybe 10 or 12 of these in a row so that you get very high amplifications of this signal, and so you can count just a few photons coming off your sample. So even very dim things can be imaged this way, um, and you can record the, the light from each point in there. Um, even if it's pretty dim, and these are very fast so that you can do this in a reasonable amount of time. <clears throat> so that's the detector. And then again, putting this all together, here's the same image I showed you in the beginning, um, now showing side by side just the non-confocal, so the conventional microscopy view on the right here, um, and then next to it, the image of that same sample in confocal. And again, you can see that the, the confocal's done what it's supposed to do and, and eliminated that out-of-focus light and given us a nice, clean, crisp view of just the regions that are in focus. Um, here's another example, which is a high-resolution view of that same mouse lung I showed you in the beginning. Um, and here we're just looking at one little chunk of it. And you can see, again, in this 3D rotation, you can see the internals of it. Um, you can see individual cells here. That's these, um, all these lines here are, are the cell membranes of different cells in this lung. Um, and so just to see that again, you can get this really nice three-dimensional reconstruction of this, this image at very high resolution and very high detail. And that's sort of the point of confocal microscopy. So now let's go into the lab and I'll show you how this actually works in practice um, on one of the confocal microscopes in the Nikon Imaging Center. This is the Nikon C1 confocal in the Nikon Imaging Center here at UCSF. And what we have here is the confocal scan head. So that's this box on the top of the microscope. This has the scanning optics that move the laser beam around the sample, as well as the pinhole that cuts out the out-of-focus light. Um, and then it's got fibers that launch it to detectors and also a couple in the lasers here. This unit is bolted on top of a upright microscope here. This is an FN1 upright scope. Um, the scope itself is very simple. It's a totally manual scope. We've got eyepieces here. You can switch between the confocal and the eyepieces with this lever. And then objective sits here and your sample would sit on the stage here. We've got here the laser launch, which houses the lasers that supply light to the confocal system. On this particular scope, we have three lasers. There's a UV laser here for exciting uh, UV excited dyes like DAPI. Uh, green laser here, or a blue laser for exciting green dyes, this is a 488 laser. And then a 561 laser, a yellow laser for exciting red dyes. Uh, 
This box here combines those three lasers together and then launches them into this optical fiber, which sends the light to the confocal scan head. Similarly, we have a second optical fiber right here that takes the light from the scan head that comes out of the sample and then sends it into this box up here, which has the detectors that detect the emitted light from the sample. So what you can see here is we now have the confocal scanning and these shutters back here you can see are opening one at a time to let each of the wavelengths into the microscope. So here you can see the laser scanning process in action. You can see the laser sweeping across where the sample would be um, and then illuminating each of those pixels in turn. The scan rate in the horizontal direction here is so fast that you just see a continuous line, but you can see the scanning in the vertical direction pretty clearly. <coughs> So now what we can do is set up how the uh, confocal here scans across the sample. Um, <clears throat> and basically what we're going to do is set up each of these channels in turn. So I can do the red channel here and then set appropriate laser powers and detector gains to get a good signal here. Once we've done that, then we can uh, set it up to do the full three color image. So we'll acquire first the blue channel, then the green channel, and then finally the red channel here. Um, and so this automatically takes a single slice, so this is a single focal plane through our sample. We can then set up so that we can do the full volume here, then adjust the bottom and top settings here. So now we can set it up to do a full Z stack through our sample, and what you'll see here is the, the individual planes as they get acquired. So it's doing blue, then green, then red, and then it's moving Z, and then repeating that process. Here, this is a slice from a mouse kidney uh, that's been fixed and stained for DNA. These are nuclei of the cells. The green is actin, and then the red is uh, a cell surface marker. It binds to specific cells in here. As you've seen in the lab, the confocal microscope requires that you scan the image point by point, or scan your sample point by point to build up an image. And this has one major drawback, which is that it's slow. Um, it can take you a second or more to acquire an image. And so this is often a significant problem if you're trying to look at processes that occur quickly, particularly if you're trying to now do this in the context of a three-dimensional image where you need to take many images to build up that 3D reconstruction. Um, so one major drawback of confocal is that it's very slow. Another drawback, which I haven't gone into, is that these photomultiplier tubes that we use as detectors, because they're fast, are not all that efficient. They only record about a quarter of the light that hits, to, hits them, and as compared to maybe 90% of the light for a camera. And so confocal microscopes are not that sensitive, and so they're not the best choice for dim samples. And so these two drawbacks together mean that laser scanning confocal microscopes of the kind you've just seen are not really optimal for imaging live cells or fast processes. And so there's a solution to that, which is to use multiple pinholes in a camera. And this is a technique called spinning disk confocal microscopy. And so the idea here is that we replace our single pinhole with a disk punched full of holes. And these holes are arranged in a spiral such that if you spin this disk around its axis, those pinholes sweep out over the sample once and only once, and so that they completely fill the image of your sample with light without scanning any of it multiple times. The idea then is you take a second disk on top of that that has micro lenses which can focus laser beams through those pinholes, and now you've basically got a conventional confocal microscope that can scan many, many points at once. The idea is as this disk spins, you illuminate a whole bunch of points on your sample, the disk, those points emit light, light goes back through the pinholes in the disk, and then is now focused onto a camera, and then this disk spins very fast, it spins about 5,000 RPM, so that as it rotates, those pinholes sweep out over every point in the sample, and you can illuminate the entire sample once every um, 33 milliseconds. So at full video rate, at 30 frames per second, you can acquire images, confocal images from your sample. Um, so we've eliminated our, our speed problem by replacing one pinhole with many, and 
We've also now increased our sensitivity by using a highly sensitive CCD camera instead of our not so sensitive photomultiplier tube. Here's what the disk actually looks like. So this is an image taken of the um, disk of the spinning disk confocal we have in the imaging center just by stopping the rotation. And so you can see there's this spiral grid of pinholes and they're arranged so that when this thing is rotated they fill the, they sweep out over the whole image. Um, here's an example image. This is a Drosophila cell that is expressing GFP targeted to chromosomes and the red fluorescent protein cherry targeted to tubule, and this is actually an image that Nico took. And if we, um, we've done this time lapse here, and so you can see the cell dividing in real time. Um, this is probably a 15 minute movie compressed into a few seconds. Similarly, here's a, a three dimensional reconstruction example, and this is a yeast cell, a Brewer's yeast cell, um, expressing a red fluorescent protein targeted to mitochondria. And this is a, a Z stack of the kind we showed earlier, reconstructed in three dimensions. And you can see the very intricate, detailed meshwork of these mitochondrial networks um, shown in this live cell here. And this whole image was acquired in maybe 30 seconds, this whole stack. So let's go to the lab and I'll, I'll show you the spinning disk confocal and how that is put together. So this is our spinning disk confocal here in the Nikon Imaging Center. This system, you'll notice, is mounted on an inverted scope. And there's a plexiglass box on here, which is there for temperature control of live specimens. You can do imaging of live cells on here, since spinning disk confocal is particularly good for live cell imaging. The confocal itself is this box right here. This, again, has an optical fiber that connects it to the laser launch that provides the illumination for the confocal. And you'll notice that the confocal head here sits between the microscope and then the camera, which is this unit out here. Um, and so this is a, effectively a passive unit. Um, it provides illumination, but the confocal part is done entirely without any control. The disk just spins and you get a confocal image. So you can put, basically put this between any scope and any camera and get a confocal image. The lasers that supply the illumination to it sit off to the left of the scope over here. And finally, I just want to mention one other technique in this family of optical sectioning approaches. And this is called two-photon microscopy, or more generally, multi-photon microscopy. And the idea here is that you can use two photons to do the work of one. So that instead of exciting, so a conventional fluorescence dye would be excited using this blue um, arrow here. So you take a single photon at an energy that's enough to kick it up into its excited state and then it'll re-emit in green. And this is how pretty much all microscopy processes work. But it turns out if you take two photons of half the energy here and excite in quick succession with those, such that they both hit the dye at almost exactly the same time, you can now add up these two half energy photons to get the full energy of excitation. And that will give rise to excitation as well. And because you need two photons here instead of one, this process now depends on the square of the intensity of the light hitting the sample, which means that out-of-focus light, because it's much dimmer than the in-focus light, isn't going to excite anything to an appreciable level. And so the only place you'll get excitation from is at the focal spot of your confocal. And because now you're only getting light from the in-focus spot, there's no out-of-focus light, and so you no longer need a pinhole. And this means that you can become much more efficient at light collection. And so this process turns out to work extremely well for thick samples. Here's an example of this in a cuvette here. So this is just a cuvette filled with a red dye. It's being excited from the left here with a green laser and excited from the right here with an infrared laser that's a, doing two photon excitation. And so here you can see this out of focus problem that this green laser is exciting this whole cone through the sample, whereas the red laser here is just exciting this little pinprick in the center of the the cuvette, which is just where that light is, is most intense in giving rise to um, excitation. And so because there's no out of focus light here, you can now just record all the fluorescence that comes out of your sample and that gives you an image of just the in focus parts. So this two photon microscopy, or you can do it with three photons, so multi photon microscopy, turns out to be very good for looking at really thick specimens, even um, things like tissues in live mice 
um, where there's a lot of out of focus light and, and you have the image very deep up to you know, a millimeter into a sample. So finally, I just wanted to end by giving a sense of where these different techniques come into play and what kind of samples they're best suited for. So conventional microscopy, also known as wide field microscopy, works best on thinnish specimens, things less than maybe 20 microns thick. Um, spinning disk confocal also comes into play in these same thickness reg regimes. So for th thin samples where you need high resolution, particularly in three dimensions, spinning disk confocal is generally your method of choice. Um, if you don't need such high resolution and, or you don't need 3D information, often wide field microscopy is sufficient. These techniques are both fast and they're both highly sensitive. For thicker specimens, you start to have more and more problems with out-of-focus light. And so when you get thicker than 20 microns, say, especially when you get up to something as thick as 50 microns, this is where laser scanning or point scanning confocal really shines. As I said earlier, it has some drawbacks. It's slow and it's not as sensitive as, as spinning disk microscopy or wide field microscopy, but it's very good at getting rid of out of focus light and so it really shines for these thicker specimens. But even it has limits and much above 100 microns, certainly once you get beyond 200 microns, even the pinholes here in the, in the laser scanning confocal are not sufficient to get rid of all the out of focus light. And it's in the, for those really thick specimens that two photon microscopy really comes into its own. Um, it also tends to be slow and not as sensitive as these other techniques, but it's really the only thing that's capable of imaging those really thick specimens. So hopefully I've given you an overview of how these techniques work and some sense of how they come into play. Thank you.